meeting tonight. Uh, thank you for my colleagues in the Department of Modern Languages for helping organize this event and for the students for attending this wonderful event. And most importantly to our panelists who have graciously accepted our invitation to come speak to you about some of the exciting career options that are available to students who pursue degrees in modern languages and literatures. Um, I'd also like to thank Kim Nikolenko from uh, Career Planning uh, <coughs> Services who has had a great hand in putting this panel together. So, uh, <coughs> thanks for uh, you back there. Um, so, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'd like to uh, tell you briefly about the format for the evening. It's going to be fairly informal. I will introduce uh, each <coughs> panelist individually, and then I'll turn the mic over to them. You guys can speak for as long as you like about your career path. Uh, share your insights about how your uh, time spent at Fairfield University prepared you for your careers, uh, your professional lives after Fairfield University, and how your experiences perhaps studying abroad or your <coughs> skills have made you um, competitive in today's increasingly global marketplaces. So I'm sure we're all looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, after the end, after you have spoken, uh, we'll open the floor up to questions from the audience. I'm sure you all have questions about how you can use some of the skills that you're acquiring now in your core language classes or in your upper level classes uh, when you get out there into the workforce. So we're all looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, we have Zach Gross, and Zach is, Zach is program manager from Simple Smiles. Uh, we have Alexander Pusciolo, who is a business analyst at GE Capital. We have our old friend Carol Chiolo, who has taught for us in Fairfield in the past, uh, who is at Yale University. We have James Costa, who teaches at Xavier High School. Uh, we have Jennifer Rawlinson, who is a registered nurse and works at St. Vincent's Medical Center. And we have Dave Guzman, who I'm very interested to hear about your personal um, interests and hobbies. So, uh, without further ado, we can begin uh, with Zach Gross. If you don't mind uh, taking the floor and you can come from there and getting started. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me here. You said I could talk for as long as I wanted, so. <laughs> um, I think we seem like a fun group. We'll try to make this fun for everyone. Um, I graduated from Fairfield in 2012, along with Allie, and I majored in Spanish while I was here. And I kind of feel like I cheated in terms of my career path because I was involved with the not-for-profit organization that I currently work for, Simply Smiles since I was in high school, actually. And so I volunteered with them for a week in 2008 after I graduated high school, became an intern throughout my summers uh, when I was at Fairfield, and fortunately was offered a job once I graduated. But going on that experience to Mexico as a volunteer at our project locations down in Oaxaca in southern Mexico, it um, I guess it validated my decision to be a language major. I came in as an English major and a Spanish minor and flip-flopped those when I was here um, during my freshman year. I just thought that studying a language would be really fun and I already knew English pretty well, so I figured um, I should study something that I had a real passion for and that just really fascinated me. So. I loved my time when I was here. I had great professors. Um, the language department is really great here at Fairfield. I um, studied abroad in Nicaragua through the Fairfield program that um, we have with our sister university down there, UCA, and that was another wonderful experience. It really taught me a lot to just be comfortable in my own skin. I had never really been away from my family and friends for that period of time, um, especially taking courses in another language was a little intimidating for me. But all my classes were in Spanish. It was a great opportunity to be forced to speak a language. I had spent time in Mexico um, a few weeks over the summers practicing my Spanish, but really when I was in Nicaragua, I had to really practice my language skills and it taught me to just kind of go for things and not think as much about how people would judge me or it just really taught me how to be 
more self-confident. Um, it was also a lot of fun. So I would encourage you all um, to study abroad and consider the program in Nicaragua, um, especially. Currently, during my job at Simply Smiles, I do a lot. My title is Senior Program Manager. That is just a catch-all term. That means that I do a lot of things. I, if you read my, <laughs> um, that's usually how manager, managerial positions go. Um, you can read in my bio that uh, I have been trained in how to test fecal samples. Um, it's not something I expected to do after I graduated, but we do medical clinics down in southern Mexico. So that's something that I learned. Uh, I now have my bus driver's license because we drive a bus out to South Dakota on the Native American reservation where we work. Uh, I just do a lot of diverse things, not things that I were necessarily thinking about when I was studying at Fairfield. But I think the curriculum here, and especially in the modern language department, just made me a more well-rounded person, someone who was able to uh, more ably think on their feet and just kind of, I don't know, just have fun. <laughs> so uh, that is it for now, I think, but I will pass it along to Allie. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so can everyone hear me? All right, can everyone hear me now? <laughs> um, is anyone out there a business? Also studying, studying in the School of Business at all? Hands? OK. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so I was a finance major, and I minored in Spanish and environmental studies. And I'm currently a business analyst at GE Capital. I've been there for about one and a half years. And before that, I was in a rotational program also at GE in the energy financial services business. Um, so I'll get into a little bit about what I do later, but um, I, as a junior, I received an email from the Dolan School of Business, and it said, apply for this internship at Energy Financial Services at GE, and I thought, wow, that's perfect. It combines my field of study with the finance and environmental, and, you know, when I chose my major and minors, I just did what I was passionate about and never thought that I could find something that would combine them, so that was awesome. I went for it. Um, got the internship, um, and I really, I do think that maybe having the language experiences that I had at Fairfield on my resume may, may have helped me to get that initial interview. Um, just being a Spanish minor, and then um, I study abroad in Seville, Spain, um, and then also just a funny story, side note, I came in as a freshman at Fairfield, went to the activity fair, I was all excited to sign up for all the clubs and activities, and I went around and I said, where's the Spanish club? And people said, oh, I don't think we have a Spanish club. So I decided to start a Spanish club. And it was just a low-key, fun thing to um, you know, keep Spanish culture and um, speaking alive on campus. So um, just having that on my resume, I think maybe have you know, differentiated me from other candidates applying to the internship. Um, so at the end of the summer, I received a full-time offer for um, after graduation, which I was very excited about. Um, I loved my time there. Uh, so after graduation, I started the program, which was two years, um, and you rotate between different types of energy and different types of business within the company. So um, you're able to choose your top three choices. And for my second rotation, I chose the international <laughs> portfolio team, um, and I basically sought out opportunities to use my Spanish because I'm so passionate about it and I didn't want to lose it. Um, so I basically made it known that I wanted to work on any deal that was in a Spanish-speaking country or any opportunity I had to do anything involved with Spanish. So um, some examples of things I got to do, I got to translate some legal documents into from Spanish to English, which was really fun for me. <laughs> um, I also was, like I said, put on deals in Spanish-speaking countries. So I worked on a cogeneration plant in Mexico. I worked on solar farm in Spain, um, amongst others. And um, for example, one of um, the deals, we had to do a ne negotiation with a Spanish-speaking team. And um, my team, you know, we are negotiating in English, 
but they would have the team we were negotiating with would have side conversations in Spanish. So my team kind of looked to me to ask what they were saying or kind of <laughs> get an idea of what was going on in their little side conversations. So just things like that have been really fun opportunities for me. And I feel like um, adding those to my daily work, it's something that I'm passionate about, something that I'm really interested in. So it really helps me to commit and you know succeed more in the workplace. So I encourage you all, whatever field you go into, to you know really find something you're passionate about and work towards that. Um, so I mentioned I studied abroad in Seville, Spain, and that's where I really worked on my fluency. I lived with a host family. Um, I also was on the swim team at Fairfield here. So um, going abroad, my first priority was to find a team to train with. So um, I found a team to train with in Seville, and that was one of the most intimidating experiences of my life and one of the most incredible experiences. Um, I walked into the team. They, they really didn't speak English at all, and I didn't know any swimming terms, obviously. And um, the, the team was, all the swimmers my age were like, who is this American butterfly girl coming to take our spot? And I tried to tell them, no, I, I'm just here to stay in shape. I'm not trying to take anyone's spot. And they really, it was hard for me to fit in. Um, but they ended up being lifelong friends, and I was just talking to one of them yesterday. So um, really, if you do get the chance to study abroad, really go out of your comfort zone. It will be worth it, I promise. And you may have an amazing experience. Um, and as far as careers, if you have that on your resume or you bring it up in an interview, you never know who may be the hiring manager that may have studied abroad and um, is really impressed with your ability to step out of your comfort zone and try new things. Um, and then just some tips. I really, really um, can't stress enough networking, networking, networking. I'm sure you guys have all heard that a million times. But um, you know, once I was in GE, um, that's how I continued to go to the next rotation that I wanted was through networking. You know, hey, can I just grab a coffee with you here about what you do? Um, that's how I was able to get my first choice for the next rotation. And then um, ultimately, my current job, I switched from Energy Financial Services to GE Capital Americas. Um, it's all through networking. So um, can't stress that enough. And take advantage of all Fairfield has to offer, the Career Planning Center, um, any clubs and activities um, within the modern languages um, area, and career fairs, things like that. So thanks. Okay, can you hear me all right? So just uh, for curiosity, who's what's the breakdown here? How many seniors do we have in the room? Okay, yeah, so you're kind of staring this down in the face. It's, it's crunch time. How many of you have a good idea of what you want to be when you grow up? Excellent. All right, that's one. Hey, that's good too, maybe. All right, that's great. Yeah? Michelle, yeah. You have... Yeah. Well, the reason the reason I ask this is because I came to Fairfield um, in the midst of a career change, and um, I really th I thought for a while I knew what I wanted to be, and then I realized nah I didn't really think nah that wasn't going to work I was going to do something else, and um, and so the opportunities that I had here I think were really um, really shaped me in 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 significant ways. Uh, today, when I was getting ready, I work at, in a digital humanities lab at uh, Yale University. It's an experimental sort of thing. Um, we're trying to do something for uh, research in the humanities that's done a lot in the sciences. And uh, it means that I spend my days um, asking questions in the humanities using and answering those questions using computers in some way. Um, and so I was asking around the room, and one of the advantages is I get to work with a, a, a ton of talented, amazing people. And so I said I was coming here this evening, and I was speaking, and I and I said, you know, how many how many languages do we know? There are about five of us right now, two postdocs in the lab, and and we have a designer user experience person, and and so we started going through the list, and I I write this down. I I wrote it down just so that I wouldn't forget. Um, we have working in the lab Hebrew. People, there are people who know Hebrew, French, Swedish, Finnish, Norwegian, Italian, German, Chinese, Mandarins, and I don't know the difference. Like 
how that works, but they were keen to point that out. Um, and uh, Spanish and also Portuguese. And so that already, not to mention then, C++, Ruby on Rails, all the artificial, right, all the programming languages, which I thought was really interesting that there was this uh, compatibility, right, between people that have, uh, that are accustomed to learning human languages, how easily they take that also to programming languages. Programming languages actually are, are pretty much a cinch because computers are really stupid. So <laughs> it's, not, it's not nearly as difficult as learning a human language. Um, the other thing that struck me, though, was uh, study abroad. I asked my colleagues, and uh, three of us ha were rotary exchange students in uh, high school. Um, one of, uh, one of uh, the students was an Erasmus fellow, that's the European equivalent. Um, and then there was another one who had done, she did study abroad in Japan. Oh, that's right, I didn't put Japanese in there. That She did study abroad in Japan um, while she was in college. So it's just to give you an idea that this is not, we're not talking about a, a part of a university that is focused necessarily on foreign languages. And in fact, uh, we have, we bring to bear though all of that knowledge um, that we've all brought with ourselves um, on our own work. And I think it's, I think it's really, I think it's really important. I know that that was important for us when we were hiring uh, our most recent developer. We, we were hiring someone, we needed someone who knew how to speak to humans and to machines. And so one of the, one of the criteria that we established was, well, he's got to know at least a couple languages, because otherwise it'd be kind of embarrassing for him too, right? Um, and and, and and that was and that was really it wasn't just about the knowledge of the language it was also the idea of a world view this is the field that I'm working in right now is sort of an experimental field my PhD is in Italian language and literature but I'm now working in a field that is really has yet to be defined and so <laughs> I like to think that we're kind of making it up as we go along, but by the same token, you also need a very high tolerance for uh, being able to communicate clearly, uh, being able to tolerate a certain amount of risk, you know, take a little bit of risk in your work, being able to tolerate a certain amount of ambiguity. And these are all things that I think have come along with me as a result of both my language learning and my time um, spent abroad. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that the um, support that I received from my uh, language professors and then colleagues here at Fairfield um, was absolutely transformative for me. It, it really gave me sort of the idea that, you know, this is something that I can do, um, that there, this, is, this is something that I can reach for. And I think that that's something that is established within a language classroom many times. Um, you see your language instructors far more often. You're forced to embarrass yourself far more often in front of your language professors. They come to know you um, as you start out speaking like a two-year-old Spanish, actually no, two-year-old Spanish children speak better than you were speaking, but still, you you start to learn and, and you've, you're in a space where you're allowed to grow and stretch yourself in, um, in really significant ways. And I think that that too also, when it comes time, and, and your instructors may not may not like this or not, but when it comes time for a letter of recommendation, I would definitely hit up a language instructor because I think that they can speak to your cross-cultural competence, they can speak to your communicative skills, and they can speak to your hardworking ethos because you know after having gone through your language requirement, your requirements for the major or for the minor, that you definitely have a, a certain level of uh, 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 of hardworking um, 
um, initiative within yourself. So I'll stop at that. If you'd like to ask questions afterwards, I'd be more than happy to answer them, both on digital humanities and on changing careers. I think that uh, many of you may find yourselves 10 years, 15 years down the line in a similar uh, position. Um, but for now, I'll, I'll cede it to my um, ex-classmate, James. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes? The sun? All right. Well, um, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, as Carol mentioned, in a few months, we'll be, it'll be our 10-year uh, reunion. Um, so I'm graduating. Sorry, keep on the mic. So yeah. We're uh, well. Okay. So in 10 uh, soon we'll have our 10-year reunion. So this is my first time back on campus in a while. And I was just reminded of the initial tour I took when I came to Fairfield. Um, and I remember the tour guide in a really awkward moment, asking us to look around uh, the group uh, and then telling us the <laughs> stat that a certain percentage of alumni at Fairfield end up getting married by the time they graduate. Do you guys remember this stat? Um, well, I didn't marry an alumnus from Fairfield. However, uh, I think by the end of this discussion, you'll realize that I think uh, my decision and my major here at Fairfield did uh, lead me to my future wife. So we'll get there at the end. Um, I came to Fairfield uh, very much interested in being a history major. Uh, history was always what I think I did very well and what I liked doing, the research, the archival work, um, the essay writing. But what I liked to read about and what I liked to research was Italian uh, history, culture, um, you name it. So the double major in history Italian uh, turned out to be a blessing. Um, I didn't intend to be a double major. In fact, I thought I would place out of uh, Italian when I came here uh, because I took Italian in high school. Uh, and I'm so happy that I didn't because it brought me uh, into this uh, room now. But also, as you'll see, it really did shape uh, my future. Um, the year abroad was key for me. Uh, I went abroad as a junior. I did my first semester in Syracuse and my second semester in Florence. Uh, Syracuse really immersed me in uh, Italian, particularly Southern Italian culture. And then Florence really taught me how to uh, really work the libraries and, and work the, the research aspect of uh, you know, my studies uh, here at Fairfield. Uh, so it was, a, it was very different going from uh, Syracuse to Florence but one that ended up being very rewarding, particularly when I graduated, because I was looking at uh, history, history uh, PhD programs. Um, but I was also contacted by Fairfield, uh, which encouraged me to apply for a Fulbright grant uh, to go to Italy uh, to study. And I don't know whether or not any of you are interested in the Fulbright program, but Fairfield is excellent in not only uh, encouraging you to apply, but walking you through the whole application process. One very key component of the application process is that you need to show somehow your competence in the language of the country that you plan to study. So had I not been a major in Italian here, um, that would have pretty much uh, destroyed my application because you know, the dialect that my grandparents spoke was not going to get me <laughs> into Italy um, for that. Uh, so in, like I said, during that year uh, as a Fulbrighter, I really learned how to work uh, the, uh, you know, the archival bureaucracy uh, that you might encounter if you go this route. Um, but I also learned to teach. I spent a few uh, hours a week teaching at an Italian high school. And that's when I started to question whether or not I wanted to be a, a full-time scholar or a, a scholar teacher or just a teacher. Um, I ended up applying to grad school. I ended up at SUNY Binghamton, where I worked with a wonderful uh, Italian historian. Uh, he's a historian of uh, Venice in particular. Um, and he even said it when I applied that he was excited to take me in simply because of my Italian um, competence. Because so many students who do go this route go to grad school, spend the first few years just learning the language of the uh, country that they plan to study. And that can probably talk to Carol more about this, but the idea of you know, not knowing the language when you enter into a PhD program uh, could be detrimental. So that was wonderful. Um, within uh, the first year of grad school, I realized that as much as I liked the research, I did like the teaching aspect 
a lot. Um, so I knew, I also had an apartment uh, that was empty in the West Village uh, waiting for me because my mom had moved. So that also was a bit of a reason to think about going back to New York, but I didn't know what I would do other than teach. Um, I am a graduate of a Jesuit high school. That's also the reason I came to Fairfield. So I looked at Jesuit schools in the tri-state area, and there's a Jesuit school in Jersey City called St. Peter's Prep uh, that had an opening for a history teacher and an English teacher, and it was both. Um, you could not apply to do one or the other. You had to do both. Uh, and so I figured I just might as well apply, and I might as well uh, go into the interview. At the interview, I didn't spend much time talking about my non-English qualification. I hardly talked about my history qualification. The headmaster, the principal at the school, was a foreign language teacher himself. Uh, he taught German. And he just wanted to talk to me about Dr. Goldfield here at Fairfield. <laughs> uh, they were acquaintances, not so much uh, friends, but he knew him. He knew him well. And just we spoke about you know, the Rossius Goldfield method and being a <laughs> TA here. And uh, I got the job. And I didn't really, he didn't even uh, watch my demo lesson, um, <laughs> which was for an English class. Uh, so the history class was fine. I knew what I was doing. Just to explain, uh, if I imagine some of you are planning on going in the field of teaching. Um, so for the English class, I was teaching seniors. And it was my first year teaching, high school seniors. And they had four options for English. You could have done AP English. You could have done Honors English. They could have done Elective English. And then there was English 4. And English 4 was for the guys who didn't choose anything. Uh, that's the class that I was given, English 4, uh, the least motivated. The bonus I would, was excellent for me was that there was no set uh, book list. The department chair just said I could choose I think it was 10 texts, or oh, nine, nine. And the only real literature classes I had ever taken were the ones at Fairfield. They were just Italian literature. <coughs> so that became the, uh, the syllabus for these kids. Um, <laughs> I started with Boccaccio because teenage boys, they loved it. Um, they ended up recreating uh, the cycles of detention based on Dante's cycles of the Inferno. Uh, when it was a nice day, I took them out to the quad and they read each other Petrarchan sonnets. Um, at one point, a student questioned my qualification for being an English teacher. He said, is this just, uh, <laughs> this just what you learned as a student in Italian? I said, yes. I think that kid actually went to Fairfield. I, I, I know he applied. Um, <laughs> And I liked that class so much more than I did the history class. It was lovely. It was great. Um, I ended up leaving St. Peter's Prep for my alma mater, Xavier High School, which is in the city, a bit closer to home. Uh, and now I teach AP European history to seniors, where, again, the first part of the curriculum is all you know, Renaissance Italy, early modern Italy, which is great. Uh, I'm active in the Italian club there. I, take the, I help the Italian uh, teachers you know, on trips to Italy or uh, other great cultural uh, you know, venues in New York. I'm working on an Italian exchange with students from the school in Calabria where I did work. Um, and in the faculty lounge, I realized very quickly that the coolest, most cultured, uh, hippest teachers in the building were the foreign language teachers. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where I noticed Colleen. Uh, and uh, we're getting married in May. So thank you. <laughs> Hi, how's that? Okay. Are there any nurses here? Nurses to be? Oh, there are. Okay. Okay. I think I recognize some people. Okay. Um, so my name's Jennifer. I graduated um, from Fairfield in 2001. Um, and I think I do need to say that um, Dr. Farrell and I have been friends since we were 12 years old. <laughs> and we tend to giggle like school children when we're together, so I'm just not going to look her way. Um, so um, when, I, when I came to Fairfield, uh, and definitely you know, early on, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I was really envious of my peers who had a much clearer um, path uh, than I did. I, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. 
Um, and I think like a lot of my um, colleagues here have mentioned, they just sort of did what they loved um, and just sort of uh, immerse themselves in what they enjoyed and let the path kind of be created from that. Um, and that's pretty much what I did. Um, I majored in international studies and Spanish. Um, I love Spanish. I always did. Um, I thought it was really interesting. You could talk to other people um, in front of other people, and they wouldn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> um, I'm trying to instill that in my children, but it's, it's a work in progress. Um, so while I was here, uh, I was heavily involved in the Head Start program over in Bridgeport. Um, I really have to say that it, it, it changed my, my thinking and my path and, and my way of life in many ways. Um, you know, seeing so much poverty so close to affluence really boggled my mind. I, you know, it was my first exposure, I think, to that much diversity. Um, uh, let's see, I also studied abroad in Sevilla, Spain. Um, I loved it. I think it was a great immersion. Um, I met up with Dr. Farrell in Spain. We had some good times. Um, but, you know, I, I would have to say, I would agree, you know, being immersed and living with the family um, really forces you to be uncomfortable. And I think sometimes being uncomfortable really helps you get that foot forward and, and really change in, in many ways. Um, and of course, the university there, the classes were in Spanish. So that was, you know, of course, incredibly helpful um, with improving in language. Um, I also did a mission trip with the um, chapel, uh, not the chapel, the uh, campus ministry, thank you. Um, I did a trip to Tijuana, Mexico, um, and I didn't consider myself like the group translator, but like anytime we were together and we needed to have a conversation with people, they just sort of pushed me in the front and they were like, yeah, yeah, Jen, you go talk to them. So again, I was kind of uncomfortable, but it was, you know, it all worked out, it was fine. So, um, and, I, and I also have to credit Fairfield be, as a Jesuit university. You know, the whole idea of giving back and working with your community. Um, I don't know if I knew that I was embracing it at the time I was here, but I really was, and I have ever since. Um, so when I left Fairfield, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and so I was looking in New York City to uh, start working, and I saw a job for a foster care agency, and I thought, Okay, I used to work with kids. I, I, I could probably do that. Um, and it really, it changed my life forever. Um, when they hired me, they said, oh, I see you speak Spanish. You're our, our bilingual caseworker now. And I thought, oh my God, what am I doing? Um, and I'll never forget on my first day, you know, here I am like from Connecticut. Um, they said, okay, here are the trains you need to take to Brooklyn and you're gonna go to the low income housing. Um, you know, and you need to go do some, you know, translating and inter intervention and interviewing with some, with a Spanish-speaking family. You know, call us if you need any help. And I was just, like, horrified. Um, but, you know, I rose to the occasion, like I think we all do. Um, made my way there. I think it was, like, three hours late. I kept getting on the express. I kept seeing my stop, as, and I kept going by. And I'm like, why isn't it stopping? I don't understand. Um, you know, it was pitch black, I'm sure. I, ugh. Anyways, it all worked out just fine. Um, and I'd have to say that, you know, the, the, my colleagues at the foster care agency that I worked at, they were incredibly supportive. Um, you know, if you need help, let me know. I, I'm so glad to help you. You can do this. You got this. You know, at no point did I really feel like, you know, I was put on the spot or, you know, I was asked to do anything that, like, really I couldn't do. It's just I really needed to feel confident and comfortable, you know, just doing it. Um, so that, that was a big turning point, I think. Um, so while I was working there, I went um, to grad school to get my master's in social work. I loved what I was doing, and I wanted to be better at it. Um, so I did that for a few years while I was working and um, got my master's. And when I got my master's, I went to work for a children's law firm called Lawyers for Children. Um, and there we represented children in foster care, uh, adoption, visitation, and custody cases. And if you were a social worker in New York City, that's where you wanted to be. So I was like, I felt very honored to be there. Um, as you can imagine, the need for the Spanish language continued there. Um, I did a lot more uh, interviewing, 
custody uh, particip uh, people that were there for custody cases. I did a lot of interviewing of parents, of um, you know infants who, of course, could not be interviewed. Um, I did a lot of home visits, a lot of home assessments, um, interviewing a lot of foster parents, pre-adoptive parents, um, and even um, you know older young people who were coming from another country, you know, to see what it is that they wanted for their plan. So you can imagine the need for Spanish, you know, continued. Um, and so while I was there, I sort of started thinking about career changing. Um, not that I was unhappy, but you know I was starting, you know, starting a family, and I knew that it, that was going to be hard for me to continue with, you know, a family living out in Connecticut. Um, so I started taking some classes in nursing. Um, so I would leave work in the city, and I would come back to Bridgeport, and I would go to school until midnight, and just do the same thing over and over again uh, while I was pregnant. Um, so, uh, you know, and that all started with this conversation with some, some great coworkers, you know, well, what would you do if you had to do it all over, you know, and, um, you know, my father had recently passed away. I spent a lot of time in the hospitals in Boston and I thought, you know, these people really did a lot and they really helped me, you know, my family, myself, you know, I really respected their work and. I would, I would love to do that. And my coworker said, well, why don't you? And I said, I, it's too late. I already have my master's. Like, this is just, it's just not going to happen. Um, but then when I sat down and really looked at it, I realized it was a reality. Um, so I, that's what I did. Um, I went uh, back to school full time um, at UConn and Stanford. And then I graduated from nursing school. Um, and then I thought, OK, well, what am I going to do now? Um, so I, there were a few stops along the way, but I ended up uh, in family birthing. Um, I worked at uh, Bridgeport Hospital. I now work at St. Vincent's. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, being in an urban center, uh, there's a great need for other languages, especially Spanish. Um, so I currently am one of two Spanish-speaking staff uh, on the floor. Um, and in addition to the patients that I have, um, I do a lot of translation for doctors. Uh, I do a lot of translation in the NICU, because uh, there's a credible amount of teaching uh, new parents. Um, uh, and I kind of help uh, translate for other patients. Now, you know, in the hospitals, they do have a lot of resources for other languages. And most common is a Marty. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Um, it's essentially like a FaceTime sort of live person on a computer that you interact with. So you hear them, you see them, and you talk to them. And that's what the nurses uh, typically use as their resource for other languages. And it, it is a great resource, but you know nothing can replace the person-to-person -person contact. Um, with that being said, as a social worker, if you're doing an interview, you want to interview your, your client. You don't want to turn to another person and you know have a three-way conversation. So um, back to nursing. So um, it is a resource, but you know it can't replace the one the one on one um, interaction. So when I had the pleasure of uh, visiting Dr. Farrell's class, um, I gave a couple of examples of recent um, interactions I've had with some patients. Um, so one was I was getting ready to leave uh, for the day, and a patient came in in precipitous labor, meaning she was having her baby immediately, like immediately. Um, she came to the desk, was speaking in Spanish, was hysterical, incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and the, my coworker said, I don't, who, I don't understand. Who are you? What's going on? Um, and I just happened to be walking by. And they said, get the Marty, get the Marty. Well, the Marty was broken. Um, and they said, you know, can you come here for a minute? So, you know, what's your name? You know, she was not known to the hospital. Um, she hadn't been coming to our clinic. She just walked in. Um, so they had absolutely no knowledge of her. Um, important things, what's your name? Have you done this before? Do you want something for pain? And do you have allergies? I mean, these are like the basic things that we need to know. Um, so I was able to get those from her. And I stayed with her through her delivery. Now, certainly, she would have been able to deliver her baby not speaking any language. Um, the nurses could have imitated. I'm sure they could have figured it out. And it would have been fine. But it wouldn't have been ideal. And it wouldn't have been the best situation it could have been. So I felt very you know, proud and, and helpful that I could help her manage her delivery. Um, another example is I had um, a patient who had just had a cesarean section. She was a very young teenager, 
who only spoke Spanish um, and had a lot of other difficult issues associated with the birth. Um, and when I came to meet with her, she was you know, lying in bed. She hadn't stood up. She had lots of lines. Um, she was uncomfortable. Uh, she couldn't speak to anybody. And she had a newborn baby in a bassinet laying right next to her. You know, and it was so moving to be able to communicate with her. You know, she was so vulnerable. And I think we all understand that, that un you know, feeling of being uncomfortable. Um, and I couldn't imagine being in her situation. And I was so happy that I could help her through it, um, not only instruct her, but support her and educate her, not only to take care of herself, but to take care of her baby. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. Um, so just to get back to what I was saying, you know, I followed my heart. I did what I loved. I love what I do. And if you follow what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. So <coughs> thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, um, excuse me for the voice. I'm just getting over a little bit of a cold, so apologize. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, quick side note, actually, before we get uh, dive in, we actually just hired a uh, soon-to-be graduate from Fairfield uh, over at Kayak, and uh, super exciting to have a stag on board, but also super depressing to hear about all the fun she's having in her senior year, so <laughs> it's very nostalgic. Um, so as the sheet says, uh, my name is Daniel Guzman. I graduated in 2008, and I'm currently an account manager at Kayak. Uh, we're based in Stanford. Um, so take it even a step further. Um, my mom is Colombian. My dad's Chilean. Um, in my family, I was the first one to go to college. So super exciting. Um, no pressure. I have no older siblings who I can rely on. So um, my dad always had this dream of me being a doctor. So seeing as how he was probably going to be fronting my whole school cause, I was like, sure, Dad, I'll give it a shot just for you. Um, so my freshman year, I come in pre-med, and um, I spent seven days in the library studying biology and doing the labs, and I realized this is just not for me. So I tell Dad, hey, Dad, I gave it a shot. This is just not going to work, so I'm going to switch. Um, and before I keep going, there's three points that I really want to touch on that Fairfield really helped me. And I think they can help you. And those three points are, and hopefully I touch on them throughout my talking, is discovery, people networking, and passion. So now I've told my dad that I'm not going to be pre-med. He's heartbroken, but we move forward. Um, I decided to go into economics. Um, give it a shot. I realized I'm not really good with numbers. So I'm like, all right, this is not going to work out. So then I say, all right, you know what? I'm really good at writing papers. Maybe I like reading. Let's do literature. I realize I'm a sophomore, I'm a junior. I don't like reading. I'd rather just go to the beach and hang out with my friends. So I'm like, all right, this is not working. <laughs> so I go and find my advisor. And I literally, we have like a two-hour heart-to-heart where we're talking about what do you love, who are you, and we're diving in. And you know, it kind of just ties back to what my mom being Colombian, my dad being Chilean. <laughs> and I like their cultures and the way Colombia works, Chile works and different economies, so we land on, you know, maybe international studies is for you. I'm like, yeah, it sounds interesting. We give it a shot, and I fall in love. Um, I believe the teacher back then was Terri Ann Jones. I don't know if she's still here. Um, so we connected really well um, as teaching student, and her class was great. Um, I remember writing my capstone, and I did it on Columbia, and I did uh, Columbia back in the 90s. I don't know if any of you know, it was terrible. Uh, you know, the drug trade, violence, it was probably the most dangerous place you can go to at a certain point in time. Um, but in 2008, it, it was completely different, but everyone had that stigma of Columbia's terrible, it's terrible, it's terrible. Um, so uh, my capstone paper um, was uh, progress in Columbia through leadership. Um, and I highlighted how Columbia's different, it, it's worth going to check out, it's actually a, a big tourist destination. Um, and loved everything about it, great class, and it was a great ending to my Fairfield career. And then I graduate, and in 2008, that's when the economic collapse happened. So um, again, not having any really resources at home, like how do, how do I network, how do I get here and there, I didn't really have any luck finding a good job opportunity. Kind of struck out left and right. So I ended up managing a restaurant for uh, a year. Um, back in my hometown of Tarrytown uh, in Westchester County. 
um, as a 22, 23 year old working 70, 80 hours a week, Fridays, Saturdays when your friends are out having fun, not ideal. Um, it is what it is, you know, you, you kind of just make the best of any situation and you learn, you adapt, you take in everything that you can. Our head cook was from El Salvador, so my Spanish skills came very much in handy when there was issues with customers not happy or, you know, the staff not understanding what he's saying. Uh, I definitely was a godsend to the restaurant. Um, did that for a year. I kept in touch with the Fair, uh, Fairfield Career Center, uh, Kathleen Borgman, if any of you know her, love her, send my best to her. Um, she always, we always emailed, we always kept in touch, and she put me into my next job opportunity, um, which was in South Norwalk for a satire publication. I was doing some e-commerce, uh, I was doing some social media, kind of a jack of all trades. Um, two years there, I wouldn't say it was my passion. Um, I took the next step and I became a recruiter. So essentially being in sales. I never thought I'd be in sales, gave it a shot. Uh, you know, it just wasn't for me. Um, so at that point, I was 20 years old. I'm like, I need to find something that I, I love, uh, I'm passionate about. Through my contacts at the recruiting firm, I landed at Kayak. Um, in two weeks, I'm going to reach my four-year anniversary at Kayak. And as of recently, um, I've been asked to lead the LATAM team for Kayak. Um, Latin America is a really big focus for Kayak right now. We started with Brazil. Um, now we have Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and Chile. So in the course of a year and a half, two year, you know, we've grown, grown tenfold in Latin America. The team was, went from one to about six, and Kayak's only 400 people. So to go from one to six in a year, it, it's pretty big growth for just one specific team in Kayak. So that kind of takes my whole journey full circle where, yeah, I, I got a minor in Spanish, my mom and dad, Chilean, Colombian. Uh, I did a great major in international studies where I got to write on Colombia, but didn't really actually apply my language skills. And then just through networking, discovering what I love and chasing a passion, I landed a kayak and, and it was a great opportunity, a great company, great people, and really a company that wants to make the travel industry better, not just here in the US, but globally. Um, all those pieces really came together and now spearheading the growth of Latin America, really engaging with clients in Spanish from the Aero Mexico to the Latams to all the major travel players in that region. It, it kind of, like I said, brings a full circle where if you apply yourself, you network, you discover what you're really passionate about and work towards getting that passion fulfilled um, is some of those things that Fairfield really taught me and helped me to land where it was. There were some bumps in the road, some hearts broken in the case of my dad. Um, but seeing what I'm doing now, it's it's an opportunity that I'm really thankful for. Fairfield was an amazing four years of my life. Um, it flew by, I feel like, and I hope that all of you are really taking it in as much as you can, expose yourself to different opportunities, meet new people. Um, we're all gonna make our inner circle of great friends, but you know, reach out to a new group. You never know who you might meet four or five years down the road that you guys can reconnect. They can land you next opportunity or your next love interest or anything in between. Um, and yeah, that's me. So thank you. your stores. I found them very engaging and uh, inspiring even. And I'm sure that our students have a lot of questions <coughs> on a lot of similar points. I heard the word passion being mentioned quite a few times. People talking about uncertainty, not knowing what you want to do, and then finding your way, changing careers while in Fairfield and then after Fairfield. And I'm sure that uh, these touch on a lot of questions that the students currently have as they face the future. So um, I'm opening it up to you, and I hope to hear your voices. Hi, thank you so much for being here tonight. It was extraordinarily helpful to listen to your advice. I'm a, gonna, I'm a senior, I'm gonna graduate in May, so it's so helpful to hear everything of your wisdom. And I was just wondering, as language majors and minors, how were you, how did you specifically leverage your language, like, in the job process? Like, was that, um, you meant it definitely came up. It sounds like it was a very common theme throughout, whether it was you know in your current position or maybe even through the application. 
do you think something like writing your cover letter in that language that you speak, um, that could be advantageous? Like, how did you like specifically distinguish yourself with that skill? <laughs> Um, I didn't really leverage it. I was kind of just, I was the only one on my team that spoke Spanish. So it was kind of just like, it's you or no one. <laughs> um, but we have hired for positions that need the language skills. And it's definitely, we have an internal recruiter. Um, and she doesn't speak Spanish or Portuguese or the language that we need. So it, it's definitely paramount to understand that the candidate that we're interviewing understands the language fully. Um, so I think that's actually a great idea. You know, if you're reaching out to a position that specifically requires a language skill, why not, you know, leverage that you are fluent in that language because you need to be able to demonstrate it both written and verbally. Um, and just reach out, network. Uh, I mean, LinkedIn should be for all you seniors somewhere where you're on every day. If you see someone in a position that you're interested in, reach out maybe in Spanish you know, and maybe try and schedule a call, a um, cup of coffee. I mean, if they're willing, I mean, a lot of people love to meet new people, and if you catch the right person, it would never hurt. Can I just follow up on that? Um, I would, again, when when I spoke of the letter of recommendation, uh, that would also address that. I think um, it's important also to be very clear as to your level of expertise. Um, you know, if you have sort of a working knowledge of a language as opposed to being fluent in the language, and I think your your language instructors can help you peg exactly where you are and, and what you should be, uh, you know, declaring as, as your competence. And then I think also in the cover letter, it's important to point out that it's not just about the language, that it is something, you know, that this is part of uh, sort of cross-cultural expertise that you've developed, and whether that's through study abroad, or whether it's even working in a multilingual environment, such as a restaurant. Um, that That's something I think that's really important to point out. Um. If you're unable to study abroad in a Spanish-speaking country, are there any other things that you did maybe that you think would help to further your like Spanish-speaking practice or language practice that wouldn't require going to another country that you could do in the U.S.? Um, so is there still a Spanish club? Yes. 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 <laughs> OK. Um, well, I know when I was here, one thing we did was, sorry, I'm getting feedback. Um, we invited all of the students, I don't know if they're, they're probably still our students here from universities in Spain or Spanish-speaking countries. Um, so we invited them to all of our Spanish club meetings. And we would have, um, when I was abroad, we had intercambios. So you'd be assigned someone, and um, they wanted to practice their English just as much as you wanted to practice your Spanish. So we, I kind of tried to bring that back to campus. And um, whether it be just at a meeting or a couple times we went out to dinner and just spoke with them, and that really helped. So um, if you're not in Spanish club, get there and try to make that happen, because I, I think that would be great. <laughs> That is a great question. Um, so Simply Smiles is a not-for-profit organization. We're based in Norwalk, but we do community development work with indigenous populations um, in Oaxaca, Mexico, so southern Mexico, and on the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe Reservation in South Dakota, working with um, the Lakota people out there. And Simply Smiles is based on a philosophy that we all have the power to help someone else. We all have the power to make someone smile. And that's the first building block towards putting kids, adults, anyone um, on the path to a brighter future, which sounds super cheesy. But um, I went on the first trip just as a high school senior, not really expecting much out of it. And I really just felt um, and believed so fully in the philosophy that you could connect with someone, um, even if you didn't speak Spanish, even if I didn't take Spanish in high school, that you can connect with people 
on that level and then really work together to find a solution to the problems that they face. So um, we do a lot of work um, in both communities to provide food aid, to provide medical care. We build homes and schools, provide college scholarships. We just recently offered um, a student from the reservation a scholarship to Fairfield University. So she just found out on Saturday that she was accepted. So that will be pretty exciting. No pressure on her. She can decide not to come, but um, I would really love for her to come and um, be a fellow stag. So we do a lot. Um, I am never bored at my job, which is really great. We do um, a service trip through the university to the reservation every year the last week of August. Um, to your question about what you can do um, if you don't study abroad, service trips are a great opportunity to do that. I was involved with Simply Smiles and so never went on a university specific trip throughout my time here. But um, even if you aren't fortunate enough to be able to afford to go to another country, there are lots of service opportunities um, here in Connecticut, working with communities in Bridgeport and um, just across the country. So that's a great way to, to connect. And we have resources for you in the department. We need some I have a question for James. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your Fulbright experience? How did you distinguish yourself in the application? Because those must be incredibly competitive, particularly for Italy. And what kind of work did you do for your Fulbright? Uh, okay. I, I, don't necessarily know how I distinguished myself. Um, in fact, I, this would kind of answer the first question. I didn't know that I was fluent in Italian until I wrote that application. Uh, that's where I first put the words fluent. Um, and that was on the advice of uh, professors here. Um, I think that what helped me with the application was uh, a focus on what I wanted to do when I got there. Uh, it also didn't hurt that uh, there was this three or four year period where uh, Italy in particular was offering more Fulbrights. Uh, Italy is actually the first country that uh, had the Fulbright grant, so it was an anniversary. Um, but I, I was really focused on what I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, research a, this is where it might get boring, right? I wanted to research uh, a, partic a religious persecution that took place uh, in Calabria in like 1560. Um, and then kind of tie that to the larger uh, counter-reformation movement that was going on. Uh, usually when you read about that or hear about it in a uh, class in high school or college, it's northern Italy or central Italy, and, and I was really focused on the south. I think they liked that. I think a lot of the applications probably are for um, you know Florence or Bologna, Rome. Uh, and then the experience there was wonderful. Uh, like I said, I, I spent... Most of my days in either a library or going to uh, Cosenza, which is in the northern part of Calabria. And uh, you know, a few hours during the week, I was in two different Italian high schools. Um, Italian high schools, the state schools, they're supposed to be a mother tongue teacher in the room uh, for uh, English classes. So that was technically my task there. I was the mother tongue English teacher. I learned uh, in a lot of the schools in southern Italy there is no mother tongue English teacher. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't two teachers in the room, but neither one speaks English <laughs> usually. Um, and so that experience, I, you know, not so much the study one, but that really uh, made me feel competent in researching and living in Italy um, and just, uh, you know, understanding the, the way down there. Especially in the South. Um, so in that field of social work, um, do you think that there's a, a need for bilingual social workers in other languages, or is it really primarily in Spanish? She just asked if, in social work, there seems to be a need for other languages in addition to Spanish. Um, I mean, during my time as a social worker, I would say Spanish was the primary language that we desperately needed. Um, I can say as a nurse in Bridgeport, I'm seeing a lot more uh, Muslim patients, um, also Portuguese-speaking patients. No, Portuguese is not Spanish. 
Um, <laughs> they tell me a lot. She speaks Spanish, but it sounds weird because <laughs> it's not. So, um, <laughs> um, so in New York City, Spanish, uh, in my experience, was was the most common here as well, but I'm seeing other languages up here. So it's not to say it's not existing in New York, it just wasn't my experience. Thank you. Oh, that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <oops>. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Farrow. Hi. Hi, everybody. Now, my question was about internships, because that's definitely something that seems like a reoccurring thread and opportunities during the summertime. Um, how were you finding most of your internships? It sounds like you had yours that came from high, you also had a great connection from the high school. From that internship, everybody else, how were you finding these internships in the summertime? The Career Center here at Fairfield. The Career Center? Uh, I mean, if you haven't stopped in yet, I highly recommend you go there ASAP. Uh, it's I think it's only grown since I've been there. I think when I was in 2008, it was only Kathleen. <laughs> uh, from what I hear, it's a lot bigger. Um, I think that's an opportunity that should be leveraged tenfold. Um, they have incredible resources, incredible connections, uh, contacts to get you an internship. Whether it's something that you might love or not, it's still exposure to a different area where maybe you might love down the road. Um, but the Career Center, I think, in Fairfield is, is somewhere where you should go ASAP. And I. Um found my internship through an email from Dolan School of Business straight to my inbox. So it was the only one I applied to, and I was very lucky. But um, I did use the Career Planning Center a lot, um, just practicing interviews with Kath, and um, when I was you know, looking at other opportunities as well. So you're recommending to open your professor's emails. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that, too. <laughs> And if anyone is interested in GE, you know, feel free to talk to me. That's great. So um, that's wonderful with that invitation to come speak with you and the mention of the Career Planning Center. Uh, perhaps we could conclude the evening. If anybody has any questions for our panelists, come up. Let's, let's speak to them one-on-one, uh, -on -one. maybe do a little bit of networking, um, grab a cookie, have some coffee, and then uh, thank you for all for